Welcome everybody. Um, we're going to get started here. We've got lots of folks dialing in for the live stream, and uh, we want to include them in a family manner. Sorry that y'all weren't here to enjoy the good company and the cold beverages and the great food, but I'm sure you had some of the same uh, at your place as well. Most of you know my name is Alan Rothschild, and I help start to do good fun, which is a Columbus Georgia based public charity 10 years ago. Who would have imagined, <laughs> imagined back in 2012 that our 10th anniversary celebration would have included a major traveling show organized by the Georgia Museum of Art that features 122 works by 73 photographers, or such a beautiful catalog published to accompany that exhibition by the museum and the University of Georgia Press, or that we would be gathered tonight for a live stream broadcast of a panel discussion featuring three true luminaries in the photography world. We've come a long way since the 2013 acquisition of our first image, Keith Carter's Garland, which has been the show in Athens, and our first exhibition, Lilts and Brawls, which was organized by Columbus State University Art Professor Hannah Israel, who's here with us tonight, and four of her undergraduate art students. I'll never forget the feeling of seeing that inaugural show hung on the wall of this abandoned storefront about three blocks from here, or learning a few minutes after walking through the show that the HVAC system, which the landlord had promised was going to work, did not. <laughs> Fast forward 10 years, and the Do Good Fun collection now numbers 825 images taken by 112 photographers throughout the American South since World War II. Who would have dreamed that we would be gathered tonight both in person and via Zoom for time looked up today? It would be celebrating its 10th anniversary next year. <laughs> for such an amazing panel, or in such a beautiful gallery space, filled with images that rival any, though, any of those in a public or private collection anywhere. Thank you all for joining us in person and via the live stream for this great journey and for participating in tonight's program. Now, I know you're not here tonight for me to read the CDs of our panelists, so I'm going to get that out of the way very quickly. Paul and Lee and Mark Steinmetz, uh, both born in New York, both received MFAs from Yale, both Guggenheim Fellows. They both now live in the South. Paul moved to Knoxville, Tennessee in 1982 to start the photography program at the University of Tennessee, which he uh, ran for over three decades before his retirement a few years ago. Um, Mark has adopted Athens, Georgia as his hometown. It's there since 1999, I think. Um, and he and his wife, Arena, who is also a wonderful photographer, may be best known for their photographic education space to give it in Athens. Uh, ironically, the Do Good Fund is forced to own 23 images by each of these photographers, and all of those images are on display, either in the gallery here tonight or in the show in Athens. What I do want to take a minute to share, though, are some of the interactions with these two photographers and our moderator, which illustrate the sort of informal network and small world happenstance that the Do Good Fund has benefited from during its first decade. Email search function documents of our earliest contact with each of our panelists occurred in 2014. While we acquired our first images of marks from the San Francisco gallery in 2013, it was actually the seventh image that we acquired in the collection. Uh, a calendar entry dated January 24, 2014, contains the hint, the first hint of personal contact. Mark Steinmetz, Pulaski Street. I think that initial in-person meeting at Mark's home was preceded by an introductory email and his response probably along the line of stop by when you're next in Athens. What I do recall from that first meeting is that Mark welcomed me into his house, but no further than the entry hall. <laughs> so we spent 45 minutes chatting, each leaning against either side of the four-year wall. But I guess I passed the test, and that meeting was followed by a very gracious email from Mark the following week, which then led to subsequent visits, both at a local restaurant that Mark and I most frequent, 
as well as additional visits to Pulaski Street, which included sit-down visits, a tour of this dark room and home office, as well as a preview of the space that would become the human. Three weeks later, my calendar notes my first call with Paul and Lee on Valentine's Day 2014. I am certain that so close to my visit with Mark, that Mark was the one who first introduced me to Baldwin and his wonderful portfolio of Southern Indians. As I predict you'll see tonight, the only thing more powerful than Baldwin's work is Baldwin talking about his work. And I know our calls sealed the deal on our first acquisition of two of Baldwin's images in 2014. For the first couple of years of building a collection, we were very interested in including as many photographers as possible. But by late 2015, I realized that having only two or three images of a single photographer sort of limited us to group shows or theme shows. So we decided to go deep with the single photographer. In 2015, Mark had published a piece in Time Magazine Online about Baldwin's Sun series entitled Photographing Black Lives in America South. In that essay, Mark wrote that Baldwin produced a body of work that is among the most remarkable in American photography of the past century. We agreed wholeheartedly and supported by the interest. <laughs> Sorry if I'm stealing y'all's y'all thunder later on, but supported by the interest of curators who continue to borrow those two pieces of ball when they were already in the collection. Our first go deep effort was the acquisition of 19 more images of ball and work uh, in 2015 2016 time frame. And I'm going to leave it to ball and Mark to bring that story forward because it's a wonderful, very interesting. Our moderator, Richard McKay, will introduce uh, a bit more work in a minute, played the leading role in our next Go Deep acquisition. We had added a second Steinmetz image to the collection in 2014, but I fell smack dab in love with Mark's work at Richard's show of Mark's that he hosted, that he organized and curated and hosted at the Ogden in 2015. I left New Orleans knowing that we had to have more Mark Steinmetz work in the collection. In putting the 19 image selection of Baldwin's work together, I asked Baldwin for his thoughts, and he said that the image selection of the Time article that he and Mark had worked on was the place to start. So I thought, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So in trying to decide which Steinmetz images to collect, I sent a number of them to Baldwin. I said, tell me what you think. So the collection here represents a, a joint effort of, of Baldwin's input, Mark's input, my thoughts, except for one image. Uh, Mark had a longtime studio assistant named Brittany Lawbach, uh, who many of you all know is a great photographer herself. And I knew that besides Mark, she probably saw more of his work than anybody else. So I said, Brittany, tell me what image did you see and love and go back to that you think the world needs to know? And as it happens, is sitting right here behind the panels tonight, the Merlin and Roller Skate. That was the image that Brittany picked out to include in the selection. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in thinking about an introduction for tonight, I ran across a quote from Mark about his work that I think equally applies to many of the images in our collection. When asked why he spends so much time photographing the ordinary, he replied, because everyday things stand the test of time. And that's the way I feel about so much of the work that we do. Now, the moderator of our panel, Richard McKay, is a curator of photography at the Ogden Museum of Southern Art New Orleans. He is also an accomplished photographer himself, and his work is in the collection. Some of it is on display in our 10th anniversary show in Athens as well. Richard was kind enough to take time from his busy schedule with the Ogden, which includes recently opening a beautiful show a work by Ralph Eugene Meatyard, which I encourage you to see if you have to be in New Orleans the time soon. And thank you, Richard, for taking the time to help us with this. With the Ogden's singular focus on Southern art and Richard's keen eye for photography and interest in showing the work of emerging and mid-career photographers at the Ogden and God, I would submit that he, along with one of our guests tonight, Greg Harris, who's curator of photography at the High, are two of the most influential people in Southern photography today. For those of you who are under 40, I think you call them influencers. <laughs> I found my first email to Richard in February 2014 and stand by the line included in that email. If every Southern museum supported regional photography the way you do, there'd be no need for us. I do not remember for sure, 
But I suspect that Richard was hard at work on this 2015 show of Mark's work, and he was one of the first persons to advocate collecting Mark Stadnett's work by the Duke of <coughs> Richard, Mark, all, and thank you so much for being part of the Duke of Fund's journey and for joining us tonight. Thanks, thanks, Alan. Um, when Alan approached me to jury a, a curate show with, with Mark again, involvement, I mean, I was really excited because I've been thinking about you guys a lot lately, uh, thinking about your work, thinking about your relationship as friends and colleagues and supporters of each other's work. Um, at that point, Baldwin's new book had just come out. Uh, it was published by Hunter's Point Press. I believe it came out in August. And he was getting all these accolades. New York Times, Harper's, uh, New Yorker, all saying this is the photo book of the year. This work is amazing, you know, what a discovery. And of course, we all knew about Baldwin. Um, we were under the radar of, and it's through the Duke of Fun. I think I found out about Paul, but it was actually Mark. The first time I met Mark, he said, You've got to see the work of Paul and Lee. I didn't know the work of one. And uh, then the Duke of Fun uh, started collecting Bobby's work. And then, you know, of course, I fell in love with it because it's mind blowing and it's so good. Uh, it's hard to describe. And then, so I was thinking about him. Baldwin a lot, and then it's like, you know what? Baldwin needs to have a solo show for Baldwin. So when Mark, excuse me, when Alan got in touch with me, I was on my way to Knoxville to visit Baldwin. I'd um, like to introduce, uh, introduce that in 2024, Baldwin will have a solo exhibition at the Auburn Museum, which I'm really excited for. And Mark, I knew through um, his books, uh, the Southern Trilogy. Uh, South Central, Southeast, and Greater Atlanta, and through the exhibition you had at the Ogden, and I've always been a fan of Mark. So I just jumped at this opportunity to be able to compare and contrast their work and have it be the same um, gallery together. And I kind of uh, based this show on a Picasso and a T show I saw you working in a way too bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, 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 we're the museum of modern art and there at Picasso, and uh, the team said uh, they would show Picasso is still alive and Matisse is still alive and Picasso is the portrait. Do you, do you not need to have it? No, because um, <laughs> exactly. So that's kind of how I, how I view it. And uh, anyway, so yeah, so these two gentlemen, we go back a long ways. I mean, that's going to be the first question I, I asked is uh, how they met, but, you know, they're both, like Alan said, they're both from the North. They both graduated from Yale. They're both photographers in uh, documentary sense or street photography. They both shoot primarily in black and white. They're both old school analog guys. Uh, they're also Guggenheim fellows. Uh, they both taught photography. Um, and they both emphasize their work has an emphasis on portraiture and of the human condition. And they're both friends and colleagues. So uh, the title of the show, Twofold Vision, I stole from, uh, I appropriated from uh, the brain of Henry Gallen, who did a book on Ralphie G. Meadar called it Fourfold Vision. And uh, a week from today, I will be talking with Henry Gallen in New Orleans about Ralphie G. Meadar. So if any of you guys are in New Orleans, please come by, and uh, it should be good. But uh, anyway, I just love, I just love this work, and excuse me if I have to um, look at my notes. But the first question I will have to ask you guys, because I don't know this myself, um, how did you guys meet? Because, I mean, I think it's probably pretty, pretty good, but... Um... Well, first, uh, gosh, <laughs> Thanks. I to say. Um, we met, uh, I remember uh, meeting Baldwin at uh, David Cook, you said? No. Um, I had seen Baldwin's pictures, I think it was Summon Aperture, and um, 
I just want to kind of describe old school, because at the time it was sort of new school. <laughs> this use of, uh, like Baldwin's use of, um, you know, very, very straight, very clear kind of stripping romance out of the pictures. It wasn't magnum photography, it wasn't, you know, grainy and, you know, decisive moment. It was something new that was happening in the Boston area. Um, and but um, and I only met uh, um, David Kirchhoff's house. David Kirchhoff's um, since passed away. He was a great guy, and uh, I remember Baldwin was really engaged in our conversation, and that he said it's been a really romantic conversation. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't think I don't know if you remember any of this. There we go. Thank you. I don't remember a lot either. I, I, and I think not remembering is actually the key to success. Like, <laughs> process your life, you're not well in the to do the teaching on with the press. So I think not having been in the next I do want to correct it. I moved to Athens in 1994, not 1999. And that's what the internet says. And and also, I said that Baldwin's in you know, the time of peace, that was uh, one of the most remarkable qualified for the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of Then we go to the 1920s and 30s. And you want to hear the year? Anyway, I'm holding this microphone, and what exactly is the question? I'll you on that. And, so it was kind of simply, yeah. Yeah. And then, then we met more deeply. We had another romantic conversation um, when I was my really without Baldwin giving much thought. I was uh, a commercial photographer in Chicago. I think David Cripty, um, suggested me as somebody to replace Baldwin. Baldwin invested, uh, and. So I went down to teach at UT Knoxville for a year while Baldwin went to the MIT. Uh, and then we met there, and um, uh, it was great. And it was super interesting. I saw Baldwin's pictures uh, a few times through his, yeah, his boxes. Um, and then later, um, I think Tom, Tom Roma came down, and we had a threesome, if you remember that, and you heard it should do. <laughs> you might be more involved in way you have no no like it would be really nice of <laughs> um, no in his uh days and, and uh, at the end of the ball it's the same thing. This is uh, like a romantic conversation because I don't think we had many people who were like uh so uh I told him to talk about it. You have a lot of people to talk to that you so let's <laughs> can you can I donate money to the new group to buy another microphone? <laughs> uh, um, uh, when, when I met Mark and, and saw his pictures, I knew immediately um, that um, this was somebody who was really special. Um, I don't think I've ever told Mark this, but um, I don't think that in terms of contemporary photographers, uh, there is anybody who is as pure a photographer as Mark. His affection and passion for the medium is unparalleled. I, I want to describe it this way. If Leonardo da Vinci had not made the observation about the camera obscura, <laughs> the Yaks had not made a picture of the his bedroom window. If photography did not exist, the special talents and ability of Marx would, would be just forever lost. Uh, it is through the practice of photography 
that Mark brings a dimension of humanity and achievement that I think is really unparalleled. I think that he is among the contemporary photographers, uh, the greatest photographer today. what it is that this word is smart, but this guy knows what he's looking at. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I don't think anybody else can look at things like this. And you know, once he called or whatever, he just simply knows what he's looking at. And the Arab work photography served him the best. I love the child that sound and all these uh, questions because I don't have that many. <laughs> <laughs> so we can do a lot of We can do a lot of things. Um, so Baldwin, in 1982, you moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, you take a job at the University of Tennessee. You're the director of the photography department at UT. And um, a year later, you embark on this body of work in 83, you drive in your, was it Dodge Dart? You have a Dart, yep, you got in your Dart and you did a little 2,000 mile around south. And what I read is in the photo is you found your subject. Yeah, it was actually. Um, you know, I arrived in, in the fall of 82 in Knoxville, and it was that spring break that I, I took a trip to assist a few months. And, and, and um, you know, and that, as the case with any photographer who works outside, I mean, you, you need to see what there is out there to, to, to get an assessment of potential subject matter. So it was simply an exploratory trip. And, and, uh, and so the first you know, one of the first pictures I took uh, is, is this one just behind me. This is the, 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 the younger uh, person, his name is Alan, that's in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And, um, and, and, and you know, so it's, it's not always the case that when you're in the middle of doing something that you really have a sense of, of how important it will become. But I, I, I knew. I mean, I, I just flat out knew it because I saw this remarkable person and and the only thing that I worried about in making the picture was that I wouldn't screw it up. I mean, I, 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 you know, it, there, there was very little input that I had to provide. I just wanted to capture him just like that because I thought he was a remarkable individual. And at this point, I had been doing portraiture with the new camera for a couple of years. And I never had that feeling before. And so when I did this one, I just knew it. And that began, began a, a, a seven year compulsion. Yeah, and then I think I'll briefly mention it, but then, so in 1991, Mark, you go to Knoxville, Baldwin goes on sabbatical, so you go down to Knoxville, and you start teaching at UT, and then you start your uh, body work, which would end up being South Central. Um, so you describe that era as after Reagan and Bush and before Clinton. So, I mean, can you tell the story of how your project began with Rice Well, before moving to Knoxville, I was up in Chicago and I can photograph a lot of kids. Um, 
like the first time this is for definitely more adults in Chicago. I get some of these pictures in downtown Chicago. And, um, using the 6 by 9 more than 35. Um, so previous times were different with that for summertime because um, I was on a little bit baseball in between. So that's sort of previous work. And then when I got to Knoxville, um, I knew in like three or four days' time, I knew this is going to be great. I put all my work before, you know, that I did before. I was just really going to look at it. And I, um, He's going to try to make the best portraits of people with the system I'm going to work for. And um, mixing it in with, I love the leaves and the sidewalks and everything that's there. I don't know if uh, Ball and Star and the Tins and the Ballas. I love that. Um, and so I, I you know, quickly had a sort of the speed of a vision, and I just went with it and focused on it. At that time, I didn't, it was kind of wonderful because I was in this new place. I didn't have friends, um, but my friends tend to shoot it with them. They were great friends. They would feed me, you know, but so I, but I didn't have any, any, any obligations in terms of my time. I could just take pictures and then you know, go to the house. And so it was wonderful. You liked, I was at one point I was going to ask you to talk about this piece. Yeah, and so it's it's South Bend, we're going to have to talk about this maybe. Um, this in, 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 you know, sort of the dark characters of um, South Central, I would say, are middle aged uh, men who are kind of neglected in some way. Um, and this picture, uh, and I, I'm using the 6 by 9 camera, Baldwin, which is a 6 10 by 9 centimeter negative, it's a, it's a handheld camera. Uh, Baldwin's more of a tripod, I believe, you know, you know, um, and I'm photographing it almost from the tip of the set, and I'm trying to get uh, things to seem spontaneous. Um, and I saw this man standing by the side of the road, and he's kind of leaning in the road, and the road was bending a bit. And I pulled over, and I was trying to get out of my car, and I was strapped in, and somehow I couldn't even step my seatbelt, you know, and I rolled out the window, and, 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 and all the pictures in South Central, except for one, or well, there are a few that are obviously at the scene, so they're all um, made by talking to persons who take the picture. Uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm asking him um, to take this picture, and he's leaning in, and that was just great. You know, and I, so I took the picture then, and then we got out and we recreated the, the, the moment of him kind of bending beside the road. And um, I just explained that I'm with the art department at the University of Tennessee, and um, Everybody in Tennessee wants to support the balls. <laughs> and so, um, you know, super high acceptance was pretty much completely say yes. Um, and this picture, I, I like it, and I have a few in that book uh, where I'm photographing through the car window mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to keep that, um, you know, there is a I'm not an insider. I, I, I had the opportunity to photograph in people's homes of you know modest, you know, and I didn't want it just didn't seem right. Most of the pictures are on the street, um, and there's a bit of a uh, a separation. So and and maintained all of that. But I was, you know, and, um, yeah, I just was really excited in photographing faces. I think that's the, the camera is just great in photographing the human face, a uh, quick expression. And um, yeah, something that seems spontaneous, like something's happening, but it's not particular. Mm -hmm. yeah. Swearing, <laughs> not appropriate. 
everybody's been warned for seeing. <laughs> well, Mark speaks in very measured tones. He understates and he's got a picture. But the thing about this picture is that these things are like crazy. I mean, they're crazy. The, the picture at the end of the wall, that guy with that tie, that is a motherfucker, right? <laughs> it's like David Lynch in the wildest drug induced state would never imagine that. I I'm going to say that I actually look involved in photography. It's very private. Yeah, you, you, you never get there, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, open ended is like, I like to show up a lot of time. I don't know. I'm going to just jam this on on pictures of rocks and items. And which I think is great because it becomes a, a interacting with it because it's asking more questions than it's answering. You know, this one does it, and you can, you know, you donated that one 30 by 40 of the hitchhiker to the odd, and I really appreciate it. It's one of the best images in my collection. And uh, I actually have it a poster for the show on the desk. So, um, yeah, I yes. kind of agree with all the old rates. So that's why I made it much. It's crazy. Um, so, okay. <laughs> Okay, through, through Baldwin and, and Mark, I mean, there's a lineage, but it has a connection that goes to some of the uh, most influential people in the history of photography in the 20th century. Um, Baldwin, you studied with Minor Wright at MIT and with Walker Evans at Yale. Uh, you were actually Walker Evans' printer for a while there. And um, I just wanted to ask you, like, how? How did these people influence you, these major figures of photography? Uh, if you can speak to, to, to that experience of them uh, being the teachers. Um, I, I think more often than not, um, in the middle of something happening, you have no idea of its importance. And it's only in retrospect that you begin to understand that you were given an opportunity to experience something that was going to shape you, but you didn't know at the time. And so with both Minor White and Walter Evans, although I knew of them, their work and place in history of photography, I really didn't I really didn't have an idea of what spending time with them would do for me. And, and so it was really different with both men. Um, Amaya White was the first artist that uh, had a, a real face to face contact with me. And that opened up all kinds of possibilities for me to consider. At MIT, I mean, I thought I would become, you know, some scientist or something like that. But, but Maya White just, absolutely changed my career and um and walker evans uh, uh his influence on me was, was was more specific and uh and and more um poignant uh you know, john sarcasti who, who, who the influential curator photography at the museum of modern art in new york made this this simply stunning observation is that, that Walter Evans, uh, if you look at the focus of his work, that that uh, almost everything that you know of this was made in a 18-month period between 1935 and 36. Mm -hmm. 
and Evans lived for another 40 years. And despite all the books about his Polaroids coming out left and right down and all the other stuff, Evans knew he did not ever make anything that approached what he did in the in 35 and 36. And so having been there in the last year of his life, I saw that. And that was really sober. And it made me think about uh, uh, what being an artist is. That it's not romantic. It's 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 a it's a real bang uh, for most people who participate in it. And if he had known he was doing his best work when he was young, how would that have changed him? And that he persisted in making photographs for another 40 years. Uh, how heartbreaking is that? And so that was one of the reasons why uh, after I finished this project, I, I quit photography. I, I didn't want to do what Walker Evans had done. I just quit. I just stopped. I knew I would. I had no more capability. I, I exhausted it. So I quit. Mark, you studied with the Altuna, and you studied with a Todd George. There was a lot of influence. I looked at his work. I, I saw a little bit of your, your work in that, which was pretty mind blowing. And then you worked with Joel Sternfeld, and you worked with uh, Richard Benson. But the legend that I hear is you took a year off, maybe, from grad school, and you went out west in LA. You tracked down Gary Rembrandt and you spent a year with him, maybe photographing. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. And it's, it's um, well, with Winograd, uh, I, I was at Yale. And talk to that with Jake He gave a great talk on um, the work of Cardi and Don in the way I thought that was all I needed. I needed to know that uh, people could sit around the table like you do with the classics and have an intelligent discussion. And you could do that with photography. Um, and I was restless. Uh, so I left Yale you know, after my first semester. I was yeah, you know, I was I think about the twenty one. So that's uh Ellen I was twenty two and um and that's the one. And I ran into Gary Winogrand uh I think I counted seven times in the space of a month. And that's how photographing is at the camera store. And then we realized that we lived fairly close to each other in LA terms. So um so we, we started to drive together. Um, and, uh, you know, the problem was saying about you don't know what, you know, it's going to be died uh, shortly after. And uh, he, was, he was with a lot of photographers in his life. But, you know, he was a really good for uh, young people. Um, and, um, you know, I, I was kind of kidding before about not remembering things, but I like have an eidetic memory, that's the word to use, uh, kind of what I remember. Um, <clears throat> and it all seems like when I was in, I was in Iowa, the high school, I was in Iowa, uh, my parents were not artists. Um, I was looking at this timeline series of photo books 
the tarot is there. Going uh, through the pages, it, all the pictures were so kind of facile. You, know, you, you could get the point, you could just experience it very quickly. Um, and then I saw a picture of Gary Linegrand's um, like a cow crossing its throat, and it's through a windshield, and it's like brutal. Brutal light, brutal shadows, and this sort of cave painting, you know, power of this animal weirdly falling in this, uh, this, this kind of object. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, there was sort of a clearing around that moment that I, you know, recognize now that it was like, you know, I get this, I get this. And uh, so I think there are, you know, there's, uh, and, um, um, I think I learned a lot from his presence. And I like to, you know, not like if I read a, a poet, I really don't want to know the poet. You know, I don't. I just want. I don't want to know anything. I just want to see the, the words on the page and get out of it. Or in saying uh, the part of it, I think that. Um, <laughs> contradict myself that I got a lot of this describing mm -hmm. um, just he would always exercise his mind and um, churn everything. You know, this this part of the discussion, this part of the discussion winds together and just, just makes something new. Uh, I think that all the time with his photographs and his work. Super lucky, super lucky. I just figured that. The port was asking one of them to you. That is it. Because he was the purest photography of his generation. So he passed it on to you. And that's what I'm talking about. To New York. Hey, can I tell like that? Uh, sure. Papa George, mm -hmm. when your man is still at right, so, Yale, yeah, my first year at the end of the year, they yeah, would invite uh, outside critics to come and get the work. And you put up all your work for the year. And my, my two critics were Bob Papa George and Urban Ed. <laughs> and Bob would run around, he looked at them and everything. And he spoke and he said he really liked work. He said it was intelligent work. And, yeah, like, you know, he was pretty flat. And Irving Penn took his time with it. He took a long time with it. And then he turned to the audience. These were open kind of uh, forums where you know, it was not just the photo people, but like anybody from the university could come. He would have a story, you know, people from out all over. And, and, and Irving Penn turned toward, you know, he could turn his back to the work and turn toward the audience. This work, is dead. I I I always have had a thick skin. I I, I that that really amused me because I thought it's fine to tell the story forever. And then uh, and, and, and Gary Grand uh, on another occasion came and was looking at other images were. And I had been on the Yale faculty for a couple of years, and I began talking about this one photograph, and I, and I talked about its its graphic composition and stuff like that. And then Winogrand just interrupted me and goes, That's so stupid. <laughs> and so I had Gary Winogrand tell me I'm stupid, and Irving Penn tell me I'm already dead. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> so after that, but okay. So go back to what I was going to say when you when you said you found your subject with this work, and this was after when Graham said you were, I mean, uh, said you weren't just stupid, and then Graham uh, and said it was bad. So when you found your subject, did you say? Uh, the southern images and 
who started out what I hear is just kind of photographing what interests you, planning today, uh, buildings, architecture, black folks, white folks. Uh, then you kind of trained your in, your lens on uh, black Americans. Um, and then you s said too that this work politicized you, so I was wondering what you could talk about that. Um, um, no, I, I grew up in New York Chinatown, which was extremely insular. And I did not know any uh, non Chinese person until I went to middle school. And, um, and, and so I, I, I had no knowledge of the larger world at all. And, and so uh, um, when I went to college uh, and, and in the graduate school, and I think I learned much, much more about uh, the, the socio-political structure of America than I did about photography. Just by looking at people, I when I went to college, I did not know that 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 it was. Uh, Denigrating to be called a scholarship student. I, I had no idea that that um, that there was a class of people who did not have to work. Um, Walker Evans was a real example of American aristocracy. I didn't know anything about these people. And when I was growing up, I always had. From the earliest age, a real sense of justice and fairness. You know, the, I grew up with two brothers and two sisters, and whenever my parents got angry at us, I would always step forward and, 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 and say, I did it to prevent them from having to suffer, you know, the consequences. And, and so I always had this kind of justice, but, but, but going to school, I, I learned about you know, privilege. And, and, and the other end of it, a, a lack of privilege. So when I came to the South, I already, worked. I was trying for the subject because it was something that I was, I did not, it, it wasn't something that occurred to me when I was there, it was already part of me. So everything just fell into place. What they are, uh, been thinking a lot about time and place lately. <laughs> and Mark, your photographs, which I span in this exhibition, span 30, 37 years uh, from the South Central from the early 90s, I guess, through. Uh, there's one picture in the middle there of the Atlanta Airport, which is from the um, I Museum's Red uh, Commission uh, picture in the South, which is, I think, is the 2015, 2015, yeah. Which is, to me, is that's a metaphor of the global south. You know, you talk about regionalism and the global south, which is an airport, which makes it physically the world. Um, but the 90s, what a crazy time of change when you think about it now. And I think about the internet and how that's changed you, like cell phone. This is a time like when the internet is coming, and I think it, I just think it's a sea change in in society and the world. And when you think about great photographers, we have to be out in the 30s. Um, and I think he might have been conscious that the world is changing the automobile and our culture and uh, vernacular architecture and documenting things that have disappeared. Do you have any, when you're in that moment, any? If you have any feel that you were documenting something for a little change, but I think this is the last message of regionalism in the South and for the global. The gentrified effects of globalization. Well, I'm not sure how conscious I was. Um, I think it's uh, important to me to be thinking about that, the globalization and uh, how it's changing. You know, it's my time on Earth now. Um, the book South Central and South East Asia, and they all are um, in South Central, there's South Central Bell, um, there's Southeast Bell, and I'm, the phone 
plays a role in South Central, and then in uh, it has a kind of take on it, and then it disappears by the uh, Great American and uh, you know, radio towers. Um, so there's, uh, I, I mean, I think it's happening all the time. Change is happening all the time. It's happening mm -hmm. more than quickly. Um, I've shown for the past decade, I've shown pictures from ATL, but there's a ton of other stuff, and it's it's like um, more more change yet in a, in a more modern way. Um, and uh, so I, I, in early interest was archaeology, and I think that it was a really was interest in Romans. And I think that, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a recorder of the time. Consciously, that I do want to just bend slightly to what I mean, I think it's maybe your <laughs> But I just want to, you know, give a shout out for the, the many are called and, you know, the subway pictures, the other recordings. And uh, Havana, we went to Cuba in 1933. And American photographs with pictures that are indispensable from 1929. So, I mean, I, I know you're not arguing, and I, I agree with you that that was his theme. But, poor guy, I mean, <laughs> and then he gave a talk at Hartford uh, late in life, I mean, very late in life, because he died like the next day or the day after. Do you, do you know that? But he gave this brilliant, beautiful talk on the practice of photography at Harvard. And uh, so I use, uh, I mean, I, I agree that he had a short span in some way, but um, I think it's probably rich in other ways. And uh, I, Jude, John Tarkowski, I think in that same paragraph said something about. Uh, Photographers have been 10 years, and it, it's, and I just want to say on record that he was not. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, for some, but, um, you know, um, it's not different from being a writer or a filmmaker. There's lots of things people have lost there. So it's just, it's just, you know, we can argue with that. But, um, so I've lost. <laughs> well, when did Boston have him? Stunned? Did you know that talk in the third No, it was just in a week. And then a week. <laughs> okay. Um, Oliver, I guess uh, my question to you is you know, you made this incredible work in the 80s, put your camera away. Us in the know, in the photo world, knew your work. I mean, you got you won a Guggenheim with this with this body of work, but the greater public, I guess, didn't know about it until you know your book was just published. And now it's it's a it's a sensation. I mean, you're shortlisted for best photo books of 2022. That's all, um, and you know you get all these great reviews. How does, how does it feel? To be recognized at this point, and, I mean, it's got to feel good, but part of you got to be saying, "Why didn't people see this thirty years ago and see the see the greatness of it?" Which I did, but it's it's just blown up because of something really Anyway, congratulations, Mark. You you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. She, she, she was a visiting artist in New York, not at, at the meeting, and, um, and so uh, she's in her 80s now, you know? and so when some of this some newfound celebrity uh, was occurring, uh, she she's a very wise person, and she said that it's much better that it occurred at this point in your life than when you were young. Because she said that it would have influenced you when you were young and probably not for the better. And I think that's true because it, you would have become really conscious of yourself 
and and when you're conscious of yourself, there's less consciousness of what's in front of you. And so for me, the biggest change, you know, since I have this celebrity now, is I think about myself a lot. And I think this is my character. <laughs> it's just not, it, it is not an admirable thing to do. I mean, you know, it's it, it, it's this sort of really idle kind of like self indulgent awareness, which does not help anything. And so you ask me about this now, and the word that I use to describe how I think about it is I am very amused. <laughs> I look at it and I go, hmm, this is interesting. Or every time I look at my phone, I mean, somebody else wants something from me. And, you know, it's like, whatever. I mean, it's not, but it's like, you know, I am very grateful that during my working career, I never really spent any time in self promotion or seeking any kind of attention. You know, and, and, and so that it's coming out. I'm glad I'm alive to see it, but it, 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 you know, it, it's, it's, it's the work is the work, and the rest of this stuff is, is really largely irrelevant. I mean, I, I'm, I know I'm making a lot of money with a lot of people, and that's why this attention has so much momentum. You know, so, you know, it is what it is. Uh, Mark, you've been photographing for 40 years, probably around 40 years now, uh, in the public sphere, on the street, photographing people. Just wondering how, if you've noticed a change of how attitudes of people towards having their photographs taken. Um, how that might have changed in that time now that everybody had the cell phone and took the selfies and all that good stuff. So, and, you know, sharing on social media. Just wonder if you notice the change in attitudes towards the camera. Um, not really. <laughs> uh, sort of. I mean, you're not really. You kind of. Um, Photographing aggressively on the street is, is uh, I think we're more aware of one another than we were, um, more aware of, um, I think we're a bit more compassionate and more with the flight of everybody and we can kind of see that the other person is not like such an other as not long ago. Um, it was a wonderful Freedom, I think, and irresponsibility that I wish we would have now, get more, where you are kind of, you know, look at that, I mean, the picture that we live in, it goes insane. Um, and now we're maybe very careful about it. Um, you know, I, I don't know, it's, it's, the tools are different than they were. No, no, we still be photographing 35 millimeter camera now. Um, so, um, yeah, so that, but it, I think culture now is more exhibitionist than it was. So, in that sense, it's more people want to photograph, they want to be validated but it was sort of a special thing and I think all of them can say more you know some especially coming showing up with the you know big camera on a tripod and the clock that's um you know it's there was a um, a ritual of the corn um I mean I, I miss that I like we used to the movies and you have to cross this threshold, and then there would be the, these curtains that they would pull apart, and then the movie would play. And there was something special about that. And now, uh, maybe photography is less special for what they're doing. Um, it's a 
you know, if you have a clunky old film camera, it, it does get but I, I, I just want to say a few reasons uh, that it's so often the problem with projects and things that we say. I just think that it's the same sure human story that's the same that I think it's the same thing that goes on and on. And, um, they recycle and repeat. Um, so everything's good. It's the same. Richard, your, your question, I think, uh, was is it different now when you approach the photograph? Uh, and, um, and, 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 uh, and uh, Mark is probably unaware of it, but you, you know, the, the thing is, when you ask anybody, it, it, it's not a, a cultural or, 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 a, uh, or contemporary event. This is simply one of them. It's like, you know, you, you walk up to somebody and you look at each other and you size each other up. And it's all about first impression. I mean, it's always about first impression. You know, why do you slam the door on someone who will knock on your door and why do you like, you know, talk with somebody? It, it's just whatever. It's just very good. You know? In your head, and and you know, and, and, and if you were asked by Mark, you would you would you would you would you would, you would tend to want to linger and talk more because he he is he, he he's erudite, he's he's cultured, he's educated, and, and, and there's there nobody's like that anymore. <laughs> There are all these dudes walking around. <laughs> but you know, you instantly know he is somehow a different. And, and, and you will accord him, you will give him the benefit of the doubt. And, 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 and you will ex, 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 exceed to his request. And, and that's it. And, and, and so, you know, we, we have the same kind of thing. It, it's like, you know, I, um, you know, it, it's my, Foreignness that is interesting. You know, it's the the, the 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 fact that I'm capable of, of speaking English is <laughs> all this all the time. It's always really dumbass, but <laughs> and, and, and so you know, you know we're not going to change anything or anybody. But but you use what it is that's available to you, and so photographers, you know, take advantage of their strengths and shortcomings. That's just how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. We want to turn it over to us now. Well, what I I think we need to do is on the kind of that point is uh, finish up our formal. Uh, big group and break into smaller groups and let everybody have a chance to meet with our uh, photographers and talk to them. One of the highlights of our uh, periodic salons is, unlike being in a big auditorium somewhere, after we have the formal presentation, we get to break up, get another drink, and we get to have a chance to <laughs> ask questions one on one and visit one on one with our photographers uh, and our moderator. Uh, for those of you who might not know some of the other folks here, Jimmy Nicholson. Uh, photographer who spoke at one of our um, salons a few months ago uh, is here with us tonight, as is Andrew Fowler, who gave a wonderful salon on his Rosenwald School project. I mentioned Greg Harris earlier from the high. We've got lots of good friends in the audience, and I encourage you to reach out and get to know during our uh, break. Uh, the Yale tradition continues. Next week, we'll be publicly announcing that our final emerging photographer award winner is a uh, uh, young lady is a native of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Ariel Gray. And uh, she is uh, finishing up now in New Haven and wants to come back south and photograph again. So she is our third and final emerging photographer acquisition award winner. And we'll see her work on our Instagram post in it. We're very excited to add that one. Collection and continue the Yale tradition at Duga. All of the <laughs> photo books we talked about tonight are up here if you want to look at any of them. Uh, Baldwin's book is absolutely beautiful. 
Mark's work is, Mark's books are, are highly desired and very collectible. If you try to walk out the door, there's a deity thing to come out. And, and, and he capitates you, please, for the book. But we would love for you to take a look at it uh, here. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank the audience uh, in person and remotely. Uh, we apparently even have someone from Australia. Uh, joining the festivities. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Thanks to the big team for making it happen. Uh, Y'all enjoy uh, another beverage and your time with our special guests. Thank you all.